Be Frank Network. Welcome to another very special episode of Happy Never After. I am your host, Mara Merrick. Soon this will be called H&A Pod officially. Um, I am with a very special guest, host of Doc Talks on the same network as H&A Pod, B Frank Network. You can find that at bfranknetwork.com. He's had appendicitis. He's had laryngitis. He's had everything in the world. But not a stroke. Uh, let's give it up for Dr. <laughs> Brian Shepard. Hey, uh, it's glad. Uh, I'm glad to see you today. And it has been a minute. It has. I know it's been such a long time that we haven't talked. Oh, so. Just life has been crazy. Just every yeah. every time I think that we're getting to a point of everything's going to be okay and stable, it's like, okay, let's try this again, and and <laughs> all hell breaks loose and. You know, it's it's just a crazy life. That... I know. Luke had heart surgery. Mm -hmm. Seven weeks ago yesterday, he had open heart surgery to replace an aortic valve, and then he had a donor valve uh, to replace his pulmonary valve. Major, major surgery. And, um, and it... he had major surgery right before that with his teeth. Right. He some... Yeah, teeth he blood. had to have some uh, teeth taken out and had eight caps put on. And uh, so I felt like a terrible parent <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, your six-year-old has to have teeth taken out. And uh, so the oral surgeon was very reassuring. He was like, you couldn't even see that the teeth were bad. The dentist couldn't see that the teeth were bad. But when they did the pre-op for the heart surgery, they did a, a CT scan and that's where they found that it was that they were bad. Um, so then I didn't feel, feel as bad, but still yet it was crazy, but you know, your teeth are your, your oral health is directly connected to heart health. And so it's very, very important to, to take care of your teeth. You probably have a toothbrush, right? I Ho do. Hopefully I in Arkansas, <laughs> we don't have toothbrushes. We have teeth brushes. <laughs> Is that what you call them? That's what we call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and some people just have a tooth brush. <laughs> I heard a Yo Mama joke the other day that was like, Yo Mama's only, Yo Mama's only got three teeth and two of them are in her pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, that's a good one. That's uh, funny. Uh, well, there's a good one in it. it it's, uh, it's a bit risque for a Baptist preacher, but what has four teeth and six tits? I don't know. The the night staff at the Waffle House. <laughs> but um. <laughs> oh my God! Um, wait, wait, wait. So let's go back to all of your illnesses. Okay. So I feel like I was like, okay, I'm gonna leave you alone with your family. You know, give you some space, time, everybody time to heal, and then. We all blinked. The world blinked. We, it was like, okay, Luke's out of the, and then all of a sudden you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So three weeks ago, I, uh, it was during spring break and my mom and sister and woo -woo! <laughs> two, three nephews, three nephews and my niece were all in my house and it was crazy. Like I'm not used to all of that rambunctiousness yeah. and all that energy. And so uh, I scheduled several podcasts that week uh, so that I could be gone as much as possible. And um, so <laughs> oh, then one of, you were that ambitious. Yeah. So one of my guests had COVID. Uh, another guest just had a scheduling conflict. And then another guest was something happened. He couldn't show up. So I ended up doing no podcast that week. And so Thursday morning, I woke up and I felt like I had a stomach virus. You know, I was, I was vomiting, but I couldn't use the bathroom. And so I was just like, you know, I get stomach viruses often. I don't watch what I eat. You know, I just eat whatever. And we'd had chili dogs the night before. And I was like, yeah, so stomach virus and, but nobody else was sick. And, uh, my wife had ulcerative colitis, so she doesn't have a large intestine colon, and so if anybody gets sick in the house from food, it's typically her first, and then we follow suit. Well, she wasn't sick, and so I was miserable all day long, and so 
around five o'clock that evening, I just started being cold and you know, I'm fat. I never get cold like ever, ever. I checked my temperature and it was 102.8. I was like, there's something wrong. You know, this is a oral temple, oral temple no, uh, in, in the ear. Oh, in the ear. Yeah. And so I was like, this is, this is bad. So I have a group chat with, um, Eric, you had Eric on your, on your podcast and Christian, which is his friend who is a, some kind of advanced nurse practitioner in emergency medicine. And Christian was like, so where do you hurt? And da, da, da. And he was like, you need to go to the hospital because you have appendicitis. And I was like, nah, nah, I don't have appendicitis. And so then I, I text my primary care physician who was in Maui. Uh, and I think he might've been a little drunk, but that's okay. He was like, yeah, bro, you need to go to the <laughs> ER. And I was like, but, uh, and, and I hate going to the ER because our insurance is such that your first ER visit's a hundred dollar copay. Your second is two fifty, And then any after that is 500. So I try not to go to the ER if I can keep from it. And so I go to the ER and, uh, they said, well, uh, where do you hurt? And I pointed and she was like, Hmm, that's where your appendix is. And I was like, great. So <laughs> They do a CT and uh, the doctor doesn't even come back in. The nurse comes in and she was like, uh, we're going to admit you. You're going to such and such floor and you're going to have surgery in the morning. And I was like, surgery? Isn't there like antibiotics or something we can do here? And she was like, nope, I got to take it out. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so the I was NPO all night long, which is, you know, miserable. They had given me all kinds of morphine. It made me sick. So I was vomiting like crazy. So I get in the room and get ready it, for that white girl summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh it was four thirty the next day when I finally had my surgery and I was still vomiting and the um anesthesiologist came in and he was like when was the last time you ate? And I was like, two days ago. It was just crazy. He was like, so why are you vomiting? And I was like, because they keep giving me morphine. Morphine makes me vomit. And so he was like, well, I can't do your, I can't put you under if you're vomiting. You know, I just, we can't do that. That's the reason you're supposed to be NPO. So you can't. And uh, he was like, so are you nervous? And I was like, who wouldn't be nervous? And uh, so he's like, well, I'm going to give you a little something, something to calm you down. And I was like, do whatever. I'm just tired. And he gave me something that calmed me down. I remember going into the OR and they were. Was it a pill? No, it was an IV. And oh. uh, so then I got scared because I'm Maybe laying. Got a little clowny. Yeah. Maybe I, a little I, I don't <laughs> a know what closet. he gave me, but I was feeling good. I mean, I was feeling good. And so I was on the surgical table and then I got scared because I was like am I supposed to be asleep? Am I about to watch them take out my appendix? And I was just so high. I was like, this is going to be awesome. Like, I'm going to absolutely love this. And so then he was like, okay, count backwards from a hundred and take a little nap. And I was like, Wah. and then that was the last thing I remember. So I woke up and I was feeling good. And, uh, the surgeon came in and he was like, we were very fortunate uh, when we got to your appendix, it ruptured. And so we were able to get it out and hopefully control, but we're going to keep you a few days on antibiotics and make sure that nothing is serious wrong. So I went in on a Thursday. I was discharged on a Sunday morning, which was Palm Sunday, which, you know, is a major holiday within the mm -hmm. Baptist church. And so, I, I, you know, I was like, well, I, I told the church, I was like, I would have been there, you know, I would have been there but I was still in the hospital. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things. And so, um, yeah. So I was out on Sunday, Monday morning, I woke up and my whole left side was numb, like from my, the side of my face all the way down. Now, not my stomach, but the outside of my arm, my leg, my foot. And it wasn't numb on the inside. It was just numb on the outside, which is weird. Mm -hmm. And so once again, I called my PCP because I don't want to go to the ER. You know, I'm thinking, well, maybe I slept really hard in my own bed and just readjusting, you know, all this kind of stuff. And he was like, 
yeah, bro, you need to go to the ER. I was like, why? And he was like, you could be having a stroke. And I was like, crap. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I'm 37 years old. My dad had a debilitating stroke when he was 26. And so when it comes to strokes, you know, I take that very seriously and, and don't try to think that I'm too young for that kind of stuff. And, and I would encourage any of our listeners or any of your listeners that, you know, any type of sign of stroke or heart attack or anything like that, that they take that very seriously and go, go get medical treatment immediately. Uh, this is why I think also the body positivity movement has some faults. I definitely think that we should get away from the bullying and the body shaming, hmm. but we can't get away from the health side of carrying extra too much weight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'll tell you this because you'll find this funny. And I didn't at the time, but now I do. My doctor, my PCP, who finally, you know, got back in Arkansas and sober, he came in and he was like, Brian, I got something to tell you. And we have a pretty good repertoire. So it wasn't like, you know, didn't make me really, really mad. He was mm -hmm. like, for you to be so fat. And I was like, excuse me, which, you know, I'm over 300 pounds. So I know, you know, I intellectually know. And, and I've started Weight Watchers and I've started walking. I've lost 15 pounds in the last two weeks. So we may have to redo my character, you know, if if I lose all <laughs> kinds of weight. But uh, he was like, so for you to be so fat, your lipids, your cholesterol, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, everything is just perfect. And I was like, well, that's good. And he was like, yeah, but as you get older, you need to be watching all that stuff because stuff can happen. And da, da, da. So anyway, long story short, they did CTs, they did MRIs, they did blood. One, one day they took 24 vials of blood to test. Uh, they scanned the carotid, they did an echo, they did a bubble test and everything was normal. The resident doctor discharged me under a diagnosis that, I mean, to me, it was, it was one of those things where, okay, let's give you a diagnosis so we can send you home. And he said that what happened was I was having psychosomatic numbness due to my PTSD and my current trauma, which I will just tell you is complete BS, complete okay. BS. Um, I called my psychologist, I called my psychiatrist, and they were like, no, nah, no. Nah. Can I tell you what it probably was? Do you know what it was? Um, well, I followed up with my PCP, and he believes it's one of two things. Um, so I'm going to see a neurologist. I'm going to uh, get CT or MRI of my neck and back. But Can I he guess before you tell me? Sure. Can I guess? What I think, what normally happens, what I've seen with my clients and case studies is you have a trauma of surgery, everything inflames, there are nerves, inflammation is around the nerve, pinches it off, you lose, you lose that communication. Right. Continue. And that would be a consideration except for the numbness is subdermal and it's only on the outside. It's not on the inside at all. So like from here to here, I'm numb. And so in order for that to, if it was a nerve, then my whole arm would be numb. His guess was one of two things. He said, the first thing, which is highly unlikely, is that you have a lesion somewhere on your back, uh, on your spinal cord. He mm -hmm. said, but you would have to have two of them in two separate places for your upper body to be numb and then another for your lower body to be numb. Mm -hmm. And that would be an anomaly and, you know, just that really would be difficult to, to happen that way. He but said, you're kind of odd and you get weird things, so it could happen. It too. could. And, and I was like, well, if it could happen, it's going to happen to me. And, <laughs> uh, he said that he really believes that I had a minor brainstem stroke, you know, we're going to the neurologist and that's what it is. There are treatment options for that. And, uh, so we'll go from there and it couldn't be, I mean, it could be that, you know, it's just, it really was my body's response to trauma, but that's just hard for me to, me to fathom. So that's well, where we're at. There's this, there's this uh, new Netflix, like based on, I don't know what they call them, but based on a true story movie about a New York Times reporter who had a uh, neurological 
autoimmune disease where their body was rejecting her brain and it was attacking her brain and it was like making her go crazy. And everybody was like, she's schizophrenic. She's, and they kept putting her on pills and she just was dying. And all they had to do was put her on an antibiotic mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. it cleared it all up. And that's why, you know, a lot of therapists, um, you know, you can, of course, go to therapy without seeing a psychiatrist and getting on medication. But I think it's important for us as therapists if if we realize that a patient is at a point of where there are, you know, schizophrenic tendencies or we believe there's a schizoaffective or really, you know, up and down attitudes and behaviors that we really should refer them to a psychiatrist that is more of a a finder of illness as opposed to let's treat the symptoms because you know a lot of mental illness could just be symptoms of a brain tumor or meningitis or an infection of some kind while you know we would still need to to address those issues that they have uh, really trying to get to the root cause sometimes is completely uh, neurological or, or medical uh, and once those things resolve, you know, you get better. And so yeah. I really do think it's important that when we look at mental health, we look at the complete picture of health. Well, I was watching um, what we're going to talk about in a second, <laughs> TikToks yesterday, and I was noticing, I watched TikToks, so I'm doing this master course for my for my certification, and it is, I've been studying every day a minimum of four hours and i'm still only 36 percent through my coursework <laughs> and i have been doing this for like a month i'm like oh, what is this gonna be over <laughs> um so if your trainer does not have a master cert they're nothing no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh so in between like every time i finish a chapter i reward myself with like funny tiktok because i'm still on that side of it mm -hmm. And um, I left my phone in another room because if it hears you, it changes your whole world. And <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> right. That is right. But I was watching this one creator who was like bawling, just having a full breakdown about their anxiety and their mental health and how they just deal with it. But the community of TikTok is really helping them. And then I kind of went into a deep dive on their on their page. And it's like three happy posts and then one post about mean comments and then mental breakdown and then three to five happy posts. And then the same, I'm like, do you not see your own pattern where mm -hmm. you, this is not healthy for you. Right. Like this, get the fuck off TikTok. Mm -hmm. I don't post anything on TikTok. I just watch it for the funny stuff. Um, sometimes I get locked into those teary things. Man, this one guy, he befriended, he friended a stranger. And then at the end of the day, the stranger was like, thanks so much, man. This was the best day of my life. I honestly was going to commit suicide this morning. And I was like, ah! Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, how did I get to this tearful side? <laughs> Well, you know, and I sent it to all my friends. <laughs> uh, the the problem with being so wrapped up in social media is that it really does affect our mental health, just like anything else. But I think I think in this particular person's uh, issue that that they have happy posts and then a breakdown and then a complaint about is one of the things that social media does is it exacerbates unhappiness. And so there is this depression, the sadness that comes when we don't get our likes, when we don't get our comments, we don't get all of those things. It kind of exacerbates all of that because we have an audience and then, you know, you have a breakdown and everybody's will. We love you. Continue doing what you're doing. You make a difference. And then we get that dopamine rush off of this positive thing. And then before long, it's gone. And then you're down, depressed, and all of that kind of stuff again. And then it also really does make us feel, in a lot of ways, inadequate, even if we're successful. You know, when I when I was on TikTok, I had, you know, close to 300,000 followers, but then I had friends who were on there that just did stupid stuff and had over a million followers. 
And, you know, it was it it really made me think, well, is what I'm doing inadequate? Is is what I'm doing even worth the effort that I put into it? But then when it comes to that one person that says, you saved my life or you helped me through this troubled time where I didn't know where I was going to do, uh, we have to carry that high with us. And remember, look, if in life we positively affect one person, true, then are we not successful? How do we measure success? Yes, but is that also a mirror image of a toxic narcissistic relationship where the narcissist does one thing that's positive and then you hold, I forget what the term is, but you hang on to that. You're like, I remember that one nice thing. And then they just feed you a little bit of it every time you're like almost ready to leave. They're like, oh, here's just a little, little more pebble of that goodness. Mm -hmm. And then you hang on to the memory of the high that you felt. Well, their their love bombing causes a trauma bond. bond. Yeah. And so, yeah, they will beat you down in the moment that they think they're going to lose control over you. Then they love bomb you so that you'll stay. And a shameless plug here. I have a podcast coming out with Matthew Pfeiffer, who is a expert narcissist, a person that helps people with trauma bonds and get out of narcissistic relationships. And we have a very good discussion about how to recognize a narcissist, how to recognize that they are hurting you. And then we go into a very uncomfortable area about narcissism and the church and how that the church is full of narcissists. I honestly knew that from some of my Christian, like they talked about dealing with your ego and narcissism and how even reproducing is narcissistic Mm -hmm. and how the church encourages you to reproduce. And it's like feeds that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, we won't get into it on here. So you guys can listen to his his podcast. Yeah. So I think though, there is a healthy level of narcissism that all of us possess. And if we didn't, we wouldn't really have that drive to be successful, that drive to be the very best that we could be. So there is a, a, a certain amount that is good, but it's when we are, you know, in control of ourself, it's when we cross over and are trying to be in control of somebody else that, that it becomes a problem. Yeah. I, I gave up, um, Instagram, my personal Instagram. I'm sorry. Um, Did you grieve over that? Or are you just like, I'm glad that I did this. I'm, I'm really glad I felt so I've, I'm a lot more at peace. It was becoming a task instead of, it used to just be like fun updates and then it became work. And then people, the more successful you are on it, the more people troll you. And it's, yeah, I don't have time or the patience to deal with people. So I immediately, like what I used to tell you, I'm like, shut it down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, who do not put, give even one ounce of effort. So the reason a couple things happened to me personally, um, and I know a lot of women and probably men also have had to deal with this, but ex-girlfriends or or women seeking out my my significant other have reached out to me in the past one recently and then I've got it's just became so much drama and I was I it was an ex of my current boyfriend's reached out and she she wrote me all these which I don't know how she found me in the first place that's the only mystery that I still I really don't care how she found out about me but because I don't post about him I won't to keep that private, but, uh, and nobody knows his real name other than Texas Pete. <laughs> TP. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she wrote me this 20 page. She first, she wrote me something crazy. And I was like, you're crazy. Like, mm-hmm. let's please have a good day. Then she blocked me because I said she was crazy. Then she unblocked me <laughs> and sent Which me. Proves she was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and sent me just 20 pages of stuff and then I I did a side by side with what she was messaging him with and I was like okay well obviously she was hurt Mm -hmm. from getting broken up with so I can see she's acting out Mm -hmm. but you're 45 lady and it's time to grow up and maybe and I wrote to her and I said I understand you're hurting I was very kind I was like I understand 
I'm not your support system. I'm not your ally. Please seek friendship or professional resources. And then I blocked her because I was like, enough. So that was, I think last month, I'm not sure. And I was like, why am I even getting these? And then the straw that broke the camel's back, which is always the dumbest, littlest thing. <laughs> I, on, I followed memes are because they have funny memes. And there was a picture up and it was of some someone I don't know. And on the top of it printed within the image, not a caption, it was printed in the image. It said, if you know who this is, you're elite, Y-O-U-R elite. And I was like, well, it's, how are you? You're, that's not, that's why you are E. <laughs> uh, and I was like, how's that elite? And then I saw someone write, you know, Y O U R E, apostrophe R E. And I liked it. And then the, the comment that was right below it was, there's bigger problems in the world, man. And I, all I wrote was, I think he's just pointing out an inconsistency. And then that person, <laughs> who just wrote, there's bigger problems in the world, went onto my page and made a mean comment on 20, minimum 20. And I was like, look at you peppered with hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? That's enough. Yeah. So I just shut it off. Oh, also my snowplow guy um, messaged me and he goes, yo, you on snap? <laughs> I was, and I go, snap? I go, no, I'm 40. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I have heard the saying before, I'm too old for Snapchat, but not old enough for life alert. <laughs> yes, I'm too old. For, <laughs> Snapchat is just for cheating husbands and 12 year olds. Uh, no, I, I use Snapchat. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. There was this meme that said, if your girlfriend's snap score is above, a hundred thousand, then she's a hoe. I mean, it was just this meme. And I was like, I wonder what my snap score is. And I looked, <laughs> I looked and it was 193,000. So obviously back. I'm tr double trouble. <laughs> so yeah. I have no idea what that means. And I'm thankful. <laughs> you know, to be honest, I don't really know what that means either. <laughs> Oh, here's the other. So every all this culmination happened at one time. And maybe this will make you feel better about TikTok. Are you upset that you're not on TikTok anymore? No, I'm I'm actually quite relieved. Right? Yeah. Because, you know, I'm that person that sees a mean comment and then I have to try to justify why I did what I did. But in talking with the PR person with B Frank and talking with my therapist, they were like you know from your training and experience that you don't have to justify anything that you say. And I was like, yeah, but I don't want people to hate me. And they were like, yeah, and that's your problem. You care what people think. And, uh, and it's true. You know, the people who don't care what anybody says tend to be happier people than, than those of us who want everybody to be happy. Well, there's no, you can't dance with everybody on the dance floor. So you can try but, though. Uh, you can, you try. can try. You can try or you, or you can just know it and not yeah. try. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my but, problem. I know it, but I still have to try. My dad used to t say that to me all the time. He's like, you ain't going to dance with everybody on the dance floor. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I don't know. That means I'm five dad, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so this was the, this was at right the same night that I stopped using Instagram, which as soon as I shut it off, I was like, I don't even care. Mm -hmm. I watched the Kardashian show and Kim Kardashian wasn't going to post something that she wanted to post because her last two posts didn't have the amount of likes that she wanted. Yeah. She was like, I'm going to wait. I was like, is this what the world is coming to? Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. But you know who Gary Vee is, right? Yes, I'm mixed on him. Yeah, yes. I, I am too. But one thing that he said that I agree with is that when it comes to social media, it's not always about how great your content is. Most of the time, it's about how much. It's it's really is quantity over quality. And I think a lot of us, uh, me, I can talk about me, is that I, I really do miss that, that it's not about posting once a day, you know, it's about posting and finding what works 
and then mm-hmm. honing in what you see what works but also have to understand that it's only going to work for a period of time you know right and then you have to readjust the thing that i found i feel like you got a little trigger shy also was before when you were on tiktok you were so wildly successful immediately and you were just you and just kept putting up stuff that was you and now you think too much about things and i just i would love it to see you just say fuck it i'm just gonna be me Mm -hmm. (laughs) so uh that would be cool yeah i wish that for everyone yeah but you know what really hurt in all of that was that when, so should we tell everybody? Should we kind of go through it a little bit? Let's. Yeah, if you, yeah, that's fine. You were on TikTok, and then you can tell the story. So I made this post that said that if you are 16 years or older, that there's a 87 percent likelihood that you have already met the person that you're going to marry. Now, on the outside, you would look at that and say, "Well, duh," you know. And the the way that I come up with this is that. In the United States, you have to be at least 16 to get married, right? And so if you're 16 years or older, you have the ability to get married. Well, then if you take that and you look at how many people have been married in the United States population, you see that if you are of age to marry, that there's 87% chance that you've already met your spouse. Well, 16 to 18 is kind of an outlier, but they're still there. And so if you're 57 and married, there's a 100% chance that you've already met your spouse. And so it was one of those things where, yeah, this is one of those facts that are very anecdotal, but there is empirical evidence to, to agree with that statement. But at the end of the day, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be things that you really think about and, you know, open your mind. So then there was this person on TikTok who has a doctorate of clinical research, and there is a difference between practicing psychology therapy where we have to expand our mind and think about things and then clinical research because on research, it has to be fact. It has to be data. It has to be able to be reproduced. And so this person just doesn't get that. And so she wanted a peer reviewed study that stated that as fact. Well, it's not there because I did the research. I did the math and Mm -hmm. so I couldn't do that. Well, then all of a sudden I was an idiot and I was stating facts that weren't true and so on and so forth. And this person had almost a million followers and they feed off of this aggression that she puts out. So then This whole thing went into my qualifications and my degree and so on and so forth. And so before you know it, I'm getting things in my email and in TikTok that is saying, prepare yourself because the storm is coming. Well, I kind of read into that a little bit that people just don't say that kind of stuff. And with my, my history of being a police officer and being very protective of me and my family, I took that as a threat. Well, then I was doxxed and- Everyone doxxed means uh, someone put out his whereabout, his public information, so. Yeah, they posted my physical home address on on multiple posts with the tag, the storm is coming. Yes, and they did it in a smart way because they only posted portions of your address so that they wouldn't get caught. Right. But then if you, I mean, if you Google my name, you know where I'm at, you know, and, and as a pastor, it's very difficult to hide your yeah. your identity and where you're at because, you know, we, we are public figures, you know, as a therapist, uh, for the most part, you're, you're a public figure. Uh, so it's not difficult to, to put two and two together and, and see that. So at that point I became very concerned about my safety, about my family's safety. And so I, and because docs being docs is a federal offense, I made a report with the FBI and they were like, look, you know, TikTok is owned by China and we cannot make them give us who this user is. So you're kind of just out of luck. And so at that point, I was like, TikTok is completely unsafe 
for me to be on if we cannot trace back to who that user is. And then after, you know, talking to you, I was like, I just don't think this is a good idea for me to be here. And then all of a sudden enough of this lady's minions had reported my account that my account was banned. And I was like, it's not worth, it's not worth going back and starting over and trying to do this. And especially with it, it being so hostile and being unsafe. And there's just a lot of stuff out there. TikTok is mean, like Instagram and Facebook, although they are a little biased and they have, they do sway one way or the other. They do, they do, they are tougher Mm -hmm. on the use. You can't just go and bully someone. Right. Well, you know, there was this, and I don't know if you saw it or not, but you remember the uh, the videos to the Bust It, the Bust It song? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and it was mostly girls twerking in the Bust It part where they fell to the floor. Well, there was this video of this young black man who was very well endowed, we'll say, and he was in his underwear and his bulge and he was touching his bulge. Well, then when it got to the part of Bust It, he had gone to the floor, he was masturbating and got off on TikTok. And so it was reported like crazy and it was never taken down. It's insane. But mine of saying that if you're 16 or older, 87% chance that you've been married before or or have met your spouse was taken down due to false information. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so I come to the conclusion that it's not about the content it's about how many people report it. Yeah. And and that's not safe. It is legitimately run by algorithms. Mm-hmm. So you there are no that it's judge jury, the whole deal is all electronic based. So there is no like I'll put this up on the HNA pod Instagram, but Perez Hilton got kicked off of TikTok <laughs> and it was a real low point in humanity. I think he was crying. He reached out to, he's like a 45 year old man also. And he reached out to these 16 year old girls that were the number one girls on TikTok to see if they could sway TikTok to bring him back. And I was like, what point in your life mm-hmm. are you at where you're like, I gotta be on TikTok or else my life is meaningless. I like, whoa, bro, like reassess everything. Well, you know, the lady that that led all of this towards me, she was in her late 60s, early 70s. And I'm like, at what point is your life so miserable that you have a whole channel just dedicated to saying things that people are posting that's false? You know, at, at what life, what point is your life miserable? It's so, mis- and it's, so I've been reading a lot of, uh, reports and abstracts that talk about the heightened levels of anxiety that especially our youth have now, um, just having accounts versus and how much they're using them. And we've got to, got to manage your social media time. Absolutely. And, and I do want to add too, because there was, there was quite a bit of information that said that I had misrepresented, uh, who I was. And as far as my credentials. I have a doctorate of clinical Christian counseling psychology. You know, that that gives me by degree a clinical psychologist. You know, if you're a medical doctor, you're not going to say that you're not a doctor just because medical is in the name. And the reason that I I portrayed myself as such is simply because within Christian psychology, there are so many different things. There's monotheistic uh, counseling, there's noethetic counseling, there's uh, theistic counseling. And what all of that does is scripture based alone. If it is contrary to the word of God, you're sinning. And because you're sinning is why you're having mental illness and you need to repent and you need to do this and you need to do that. Well, my degree in Christian psychology is psychology, traditional psychology from a Christian viewpoint in that I am a Christian, I'm a pastor, and you can trust me on a religious level to give you traditional psychological help in a clinical setting. You know, to me, there's there was a, a distinct difference in what I do based on as, uh, you know, if I were to say I'm a Christian psychologist, that could mean a lot of stuff. I let you go through that because I knew that was 
it's important for you to tell everyone where you're at. Yeah. But this is for you and for everyone. Right. No one is entitled to know anything about you. Yeah. You could be Joe Schmo, unhoused guy living in an Ultima, reading psychology facts and saying them. That's social media. Mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't. It's not that no serious. One, it's not that serious. Mm-hmm. But I said all that to say this is that when that came out, all of my therapist friends on TikTok blocked me on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook. And I'm going, look, y'all are professionals. Like you should be saying, OK, why did this happen? Not you did this. So you're out of our lives. And so that really that really made me question the authenticity of who they were as not only as individuals, but within a professional scope. And to be honest, it really hurt my feelings. It really bothered me. I cried about it, you know, all of this kind of stuff, because I really thought that I had these genuine friends that obviously now they were only my friends because of the amount of followers that I had. And so that was a hard, hard thing to see. I have to say, being a trainer and being around certain um, professions has given me a limited case study on a lot of people. But I find, other than Dr. Thomas Whitfield, who I fucking adore, and I would love for you to talk with him. And there are others as well. I used to have a union archetype, a union analyst that I loved. That was great. I used to go to, I used to be very close friends with a family of psychiatrists, psychologists, Mm -hmm. not psychiatrists, psychologists. And for fun, they would do case studies. It would be like Thanksgiving dinner, and then they would do case studies. Mm -hmm. And that actually was really interesting to me. But they, as human beings, were the worst people I've ever met. One of them hit my dog, like punched him in the, punch Frank in the face I picked him up. This was when I was really close friends with Andrew. I picked him up. I was like shaking horribly because Frank gets upset when my dog, the Border Collie, uh, gets upset when kids are in a pool. He's not. He's like, everyone's drowning and I'm here to save them. Uh, (laughs) He gets upset when there's anyone hitting anything. So this psychologist was punching a punching bag and Frank went over and he was like, getting in between Mm -hmm. him and the punching bag. And he goes, get the fuck out of here and punched my dog in the face. I've never felt more violent in my life. And I've never punched a person at all. I picked him up and I, I like, I screamed so loud. It was like someone got murdered. And uh, my friend Andrew took the dog from me so I could breathe for a second and to hold him and for me to decide what I wanted to do at that point. And, uh, Then his mother, who was also a psychologist, the next time we came over, hit my dog in the face also because he went up to a grandchild to sniff him in the face to like do like the little high lick. Mm -hmm. And he goes, get away from it. And I was like, my dog couldn't be the sweeter, sweet, like there's no sweeter dog. Mm -hmm. Not one. Yeah. Uh, He he loves to cuddle too. He loves to cuddle. When I was there... uh... (laughs) You know, he wanted to jump up in my lap and all this kind of stuff. And then, but Bria was there too. And of course she is massive. And I was like, yeah, so if Frank cuddles, Bria's going to want to cuddle. And she is like 270 billion pounds. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was, it was, but you know, I have a Choini in a lab and my lab is, she doesn't know that she's not 20 pounds like the Choini. So she'll jump up on you and it's just crazy. Hitting an animal is typically one of the major signs that you are someone that will do domestic abuse. Absolutely. Which coincidentally is why one of the other siblings got a divorce recently. And so I was like, ta-da, psychologists, typically, I mean, that is that and some other things that have happened with other psychologists who have been clients in my life. I'm like, you guys are the worst. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's because they lack the ability to disconnect their work from them being an individual. I mean, we hear terrible things all day long, days on end. And when I leave my office, I have to leave all of that here Yeah. and not carry it home. And just the fact that they did case studies for fun, 
says a lot about who they were as individuals because they're not only bringing it home, they are interjecting it into their family time. I can only assume this because I don't know, but when you're training, you're in training mode, but when you get home, you're not really thinking about what you do as a trainer or, you know, what you should do differently unless you're in your four hours of study, you know, outside of that, probably the last thing you want to think about is, is training, right? you know, and, and that's kind of how I am. You know, I meet somebody and they ask me what I do and I tell them, they're like, Oh, so are you psychoanalyzing me? And I was like, no, 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 no. because you know, I'm not getting paid to do this. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not that guy that, a surgeon once told me if a surgeon is a hammer, then everybody is a nail. And so if I'm a hammer, not everybody is a nail because, you know, I'm not trying to, not trying to work. Myself. I mean, everyone everywhere asks me exercise advice mm -hmm. everywhere, or they tell me to tell them a joke immediately. It's so annoying. I'm not asking you to be my accountant at parties. So just chill, dude. Yeah. Uh, so I do have to think sometimes I'll be polite and I'll entertain it. But a lot of times I'm just like, ha ha ha. And it makes no sense for me to laugh in that moment. But I laugh and walk away. <laughs> I'm like, ha ha, you're right. I, I, I think I away. told you one Christmas I was down at my mom's and I went to their church's Christmas play. And uh, I was considering suing somebody for, for something that they had done. It was some contract work. And there's an attorney in their church that's a family friend, and I just asked him what he thought about it. I mean, a whole three-minute conversation. And uh, I was like, well, I really thank you for that advice, and that, that has pointed me in the right direction. Two weeks later, I get a bill for $250 for a consultation. <laughs> that's smart. And uh, That is so smart. I called him, and he was like, well, I gave you my professional opinion. And that is a consultation, and I charged two hundred and fifty dollars for a consultation. I was like, okay, well, I paid it, and I was like, but I'm never asking you a legal question ever <laughs> again. Ever. Are you going to start sending bills for when people ask you? Because if then, you know, a lot of people. I'm not going to give you my address. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a, a lot of people don't ask me because I, I think people around here look me look at me more as a pastor than they do a therapist and so I you know and I try to really keep that on the down low uh, here because I, I don't have any space to take any more work on so and there are times you know what do you think about this uh, and and typically it's family members who say hey you know our son or our daughter is on meth and they're running us dry and, and they're like, what would your advice be? And I was like, put them on the street. Well, they're my kid. I can't do that. Well, then you're enabling them. And as long as they have a roof that they know they can sleep under, they're going to continue to do what they do. And that's the extent of the advice. But I think that anybody probably would give any reasonable person would give that advice in that question. Now, if they come to me and they said, can you explain to me the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two, that's going to take more than a couple of minutes to explain. And so, yeah, I might send them a bill for that. If I write out a program or do something, I'm like, this is $225. I just want to let you know, mm -hmm. because it's going to take an hour and a half of my time. And that's how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm like, you're going to get a great program. I promise you, but. I'm not just going to write something up for you. They're like, oh, can you just write it? I'll do it by myself. I'm like, do you know how much longer it takes for me to write everything out with directions? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, I'm at like 350 an hour. And so I'm like, you know, after that hour, you're probably going to feel better. And if you don't feel better, it's your fault. So is it worth it? You know, <laughs> is it worth it to you? Okay, so I want to get back to social media a little okay. bit. Okay. So okay. I was reading a study and it says, um, do you go over the social media with your patients? Yes. Because social media hasn't been around long enough to have any sort of long-term studies done, mm -hmm. but it has been linked to depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel more isolated and alone, even though they're saying you're connecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there has been a study that has been reproduced enough that there is it's peer reviewed that states that social media can actually cause someone to have uh, agoraphobia where they 
don't want to get out in public. Uh, they don't want to have the telephone conversations. They don't want to see people because then they develop this social phobia. And, and I think really is because who they are online doesn't match up with who they are in real life. Mm-hmm. And so they have this fear of having social interaction and because everything is online as ever before them and available, they feel like they are connected, but they're not. And so then they have this fear of being alone, loneliness. And, and you've probably seen this too on Facebook or Instagram or somebody, it'll be like two in the morning and there will be this Facebook post that says, is anybody awake who wants to talk? And just they're looking for any random person to chat with them because they are lonely. Yeah. You know, they're they're alone, which then, you know, loneliness can lead into depression. It can lead into anxiety. I mean, there's just so many things that can take place there. I mean, I haven't told you this, but I got I had a little accidental little uh, pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And I never thought that I could get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, my doctor, I told her that about my, I was like, am I, am I, is this the time of life? Mm -hmm. Is it happening early? Like what's going on? Am I perimenopausal? What is going on? (laughs) Why is, why is the parted red sea uh, (laughs) coming out of me? What's happening? And so she was like, take a pregnancy test could have had a chemical miscarriage and uh she's like more than 50 percent of people have miscarriages and they don't even know it and uh so i took the test and i was like oh shit oh what do you know and uh so i was like she was like let's boost up your fertility a little bit and see if maybe you want to have kids so because i went on the all these hormones i didn't gain any weight i just got mushy in places where i normally no, I work so hard on my, I'm like, what? And it was, it killed me. It, it was killing. I would take videos of when I would just stare at myself and I'm like, oh my God, I'm the fattest, ugliest person I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And it definitely changed how I felt about going out in the world. It changed. It did make me feel more isolated, but I think because I'm so aware of everything, like any small change and it helps that I feel lucky and I noticed it right away. And I, yeah. I just started being like with everyone. I was like, look at this, look at this clomid gut. I have." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have a friend who, who works out quite often and he'll, he'll be like, Oh, I'm going to have pizza tonight, but I won't have abs in the morning if I have pizza tonight. And I'm going, that's not the way that works, but literally it does like your abs yeah. kind of disappear just off of one meal. Well, for everyone, carbohydrates, which are not the devil, mm-hmm. having all protein, no carbs is very 1999 to 2007. Everyone watch Game Changers on Netflix. You'll learn all about how plants have all your proteins that you need. Carbohydrates are water soluble. What that means is that you have to bring on more water to digest them and your guts are what digests your food. So if you've got more water going to your gut, yeah, you're going to lose your abs and you're going to look bloated. Mm -hmm. But if you have more water going to gut, you're also producing more serotonin. Oh yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So 98% of your serotonin is not only made, but stored in your gut, uh, which is where the term comes from. Trust your gut, because that's where your serotonin is. And I kind of explain serotonin as your happy juice. We need it. We need a lot of it. Um, Pro tip, if you need more serotonin, dark chocolate can actually produce more serotonin for you and increase that production. Uh, Vitamin D, whether it be sunlight, uh, you know, or, or fluorescent lighting can increase serotonin. Really? Yes. And there was actually this case study, you can you can look it up, where offices started switching from fluorescent lighting into LED lighting. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, their depression rate and mental health days skyrocketed when that changed. Because being in the office all day, they were getting unnatural, you know, vitamin D from the light. And now all of a sudden, they don't. And so, I mean, it was very weird. But it, it happened. So... You know, the more water you have in your gut, the more nutrients that you have in your gut from plant, you know, plant-based good things. If it's green, eat it. 
but then unless it's mold <laughs> do, unless it's mold yeah and you know if but if you have a you know if you have a cold or something go ahead and eat it because it could be penicillin you know who knows or uh, turn into botox for your right, face <laughs> right so you know like things like corn while it does have some nutritional value it it's uh very high of caloric intake and and then you know turns to sugar so not all vegetables are good you know for healthy healthy gut production it's green vegetables that yeah. really really do and not only that green it, leafy right and it keeps you know keeps your gut working good you have regular bowel movements and you know one thing about your mental health is that i think well i had a doctor tell me one time he said most people's issue when they come to me, he was a primary care doctor. He said, most people's issue is from here up. And I'm like, yeah, but from here down really controls from here up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there has been this movement probably over the last five or six years of people preaching gut health yogurt, which I know that you're plant-based only. You don't do dairy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like yogurt has acidophilus um, in it. So that is a probiotic and but you can get natural probiotics within vegetables because they keep that cleansing um going on and i mean if you're that person that's having one bowel movement a day you're probably not eating enough green vegetables right you should be going every 30 minutes after you eat also a scary story this just happened to one of my clients who doesn't eat a single vegetable because she thinks it's the protein power i was like i'm gonna kill every time i'm like just eat the broccoli it's look on the bag it says 60 calories if you eat the entire bag and that's no calories she um is not from anal sex she had a prolapsed anus mm -hmm. from not going to the bathroom absolutely for two weeks. Mm -hmm. It can happen. So everyone eat your vegetables. Or not eating eating vegetables can cause you to have an ileus in your in your bowel, which is where your bowel stretches out like a balloon, and then you have those ripples in the balloon. Well, that happens in your gut, and then gas gets stuck in there. It's very very painful. Mm -hmm. When all you could have done was eat some broccoli or yeah, some grab a Brussels sprout. I love Brussels sprouts, but you know they're very sugary once they once they digest or green beans or kale or spinach, you know, there's all these things. But there are differences in, we should have you on muscle spasms to talk about this in more detail, but there are differences in the types of sugars. Like if you're going to have a, a Twizzler versus an apple, mm -hmm. that sugar processes very differently. So it's okay to have the sugar in the Brussels sprouts. We need our brain runs on sugar. Right. So we do need it. Right. On glucose, but not not processed sugar. Not sucra trihexagonic gluconamide. Yeah, like all that stuff. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But you know, also your your sugar intake that is not natural sugar is just going to make you want more sugar. I mean, that's just that's just the way it works. And but then sugar is somewhat of a natural diuretic too. So you're sucking all of this water out that you need to continue to be healthy. And you know, that's one thing that I have done, which I, I shared with you. I, I'm starting to try to lose weight and try to make sure that I have better gut health is I drink a gallon of water a day and it's like, okay, why is it that I can go to a restaurant and I can drink three glasses of Mountain Dew, but I can't drink one whole glass of water at the same restaurant eating the same food? I mean, it's, it's because of the sugar in it. You want more. You just naturally want more. So it's, it's crazy how your brain is wired to, to want more of it. That dopamine makes you seek more of that, that, that made you happy. It's the same response as cocaine. Yeah. It's the same processed sugar has the same response. It's insane. Well, you know, uh, the original Coca-Cola, which was made and formulated by a pharmacist, had cocaine in it. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's also, they could do subliminal messages then. Man, were people getting programmed. Mm -hmm. And you would, I mean, if you looked at the credits on a commercial, you would see that there's probably four or five psychologists that they have had come into where to plant subliminal messaging and how to do it. And, 
you know, that sort of thing. And even in TV shows and kids cartoons, more than often than not, you'll have a doctorate of ed, you'll have a doctorate of psychology that is that is writing this stuff to to get the kids hooked on whatever it is that they're watching. And whatever they're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. We uncovered on our show on muscle spasms about how you don't have to eat within 45 minutes of working out. You don't have to have a certain amount of protein after that. And because that bullshit lie was created by protein bar mm -hmm. designers that wanted you to have some, cause you'd be like, well, I don't have time to get home and cook something. So I guess I have to eat something on the way home. Mm -hmm. I'll eat a bar on the way home. And then people were consuming 300 more calories a day. And then they were getting hooked on this stuff because it had the, the processed sugar. And it was like, do people, not, does everybody not see we're getting played here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, you know, the uh, epidemiologist in, I think it was France somewhere, who put out this case study that said vaccines cause autism. He was funded by anti-vaccination companies. And so, you know, we really have to be careful on what we do trust as to what their motivations are. If you have this thing where it says, I will give you the secret of how to lose weight. If you subscribe and pay $199.99, you need to be a little skeptical Suspect. Yeah. yeah, about that kind of stuff. <laughs> And even, and you, you may or not agree with this, but a diet is not about caloric deficits. It's about having the energy balance and the exercise balance with the caloric intake, because you can lose weight without being in a caloric deficit. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but it well, is. Have you on muscle spasms? Okay. We'll, we'll talk about all of that. And, and, the, and all your gut flora. Also, your episode with Reverend Timothy Walker. Yes. Very interesting. Yes. Everyone, go listen to Doc Talks. It's really been good. You're getting good, son. We're having a lot of fun. Having a lot of fun. And I think next week's episode is with Jesse Lyon, who is a hypnotherapist. Well, it just depends on if I get that email by Friday at three o'clock. Huh? Well, um, I actually have it done and was about to email it to you before um, before you jumped on here. So, um, yeah, it's ready. You should have it by this afternoon. Oh, hell yeah. I'll put it up. I'll get it all loaded up. I work on in the weekend on Mondays and Tuesdays are so insane. And so it's hard for me to jam it in there. I understand. <laughs> Well, I tried, you know, two weeks ago, I tried to get it to you by Friday, but I was kind of in an operating room. So do you like how I gave you one week of, <laughs> of I was like, OK, you're healthy. Yeah. Where the fuck is <laughs> <laughs> But your your descriptions of the podcast was so much better than mine. So, you know, I my podcast descriptions are so short. <laughs> <laughs> they have no care and concern. I I. Oh, God. Everyone, please go listen to all the podcasts on Be Frank Network. That's at BeFrankNetwork.com. Sergio, who you had on, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have I love Sergio. Such an interesting story. I love messaging with Sergio. I love talking to Sergio. He's so, he's so positive and happy. All the time. And that <laughs> smile. That smile is just contagious. So great. So everyone go listen to DBS. Uh, but... Where can they find you in your podcast? Um, they can find Doc Talks with Dr. Brian Shepard uh, on most streaming platforms, which I'm sure you'll put all the links in your, your description. But uh, make sure to follow our Doc Talks Instagram page and Facebook page to uh, where I'm really trying to ramp up in the reels and give the psychology facts there. And so that's at Doc Talks with Doc B on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to follow my personal page, it's the underscore doc underscore Brian on Instagram. And of course you can go to the doc All of my social media links are at the bottom of that page. And um, I'll make sure to post all the information that we talked about. We gave a lot of facts today and I think um, we can cite some sources and put them up on the Instagram for both doc talks and H and a pod. 
and be frank. We could put it up on that Instagram as well um, and Facebook pages. So make sure to follow Doc Brian and Doc Talks with Doc B. Right? Mm -hmm. Doc Talks with Doc B. Yeah, Doc Talks with Doc B. That's what I call you. Call Doc B. Uh, you can and call sure me anything it. you want, so long as you don't call me late for supper. <laughs> supper. Supper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and make sure to follow HNA Pod. Uh, thank you guys for listening and have a great weekend. Yes. Please stay out of the hospital. You take care of yourself. You too. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. <laughs> Later.